Are you a woman who is tired of having to make yourself pretty every time you leave your house? Are you frustrated by uncomfortable support garments and impractical accessories? Perhaps you should try going out in your bathrobe. No, not that one. Make it fancy. Experience the comfort and ease of an unfitted garment you normally wear for lounging around all day. Of course, men will nitpick absolutely everything about your appearance and write horribly judgmental letters to their local clickbait newspapers, but since they do that anyways, you're not really losing much. If you're high status enough, you might even change the entire course of Western fashion and open up a previously unavailable job sector for thousands upon thousands of women. Yes, this is a real thing that actually happened. Hi, I'm V, fashion historian and devoted wearer of daytime pajamas. And I am here today to tell you that this gown, the gown we associate with all the opulence and elegance of the French court at Versailles, is a glorified bathrobe, and its fellow items of fancy loungewear literally changed the entire Western fashion industry, from opening up the dressmaking profession to women, to infuriating Victorian men who couldn't handle women going out dressed like this. We think of the idea of daytime pajamas and going to work in cleverly disguised loungewear as being a pandemic era invention, or at least a relatively modern one. How many ads have we seen saying these feel like yoga pants but look like slacks? And variations thereupon. But Western fashion has a long history of turning loungewear into daily wear, and it's given us some of the most iconic dresses in our cultural memory. Our generation of women is not the first to choose comfort over being presentable, and I am sure we will not be the last. Let's take a look at just how far back this trend goes, why it came into being, how it completely revolutionized the fashion industry, and how women have been dealing with the same backlash for literally over a century because they couldn't be bothered to change out of their comfy clothes. Before I start, a quick disclaimer on the topic of gender roles and fashion. This video focuses on Western fashion roughly between the years of 1660 and 1905, with some connections to the present day. Fashion was and still is used to express gender, and in this historical setting, those roles were rigid, binary, and strongly enforced through dress codes of menswear and womenswear. To be a woman in this setting was a social role, and failing to perform to the standards of that role had social consequences, which is the whole topic of this video. Clothes have no inherent gender, human gender is neither rigid nor binary, and there have always been people for whom these roles don't fit. Terms like women and women's wear are useful for collectively describing the social roles, but they might have a variety of relationships with any given individual's gender. Loungewear and daytime pajamas are a topic very near and dear to me because thanks to having fibromyalgia, I'm often working or crafting in bed on less than great health days. Something I've enjoyed recently is hanging out on Quilt, a new social app for live, real-time, audio-only conversations. The idea is to have genuine, supportive connections with other people, and there are conversations about every topic from self-care and self-exploration to spirituality, relationships, career building, fashion, music, and just about everything else. Dealing with chronic illness can be really isolating, especially for extroverts like me, and if I'm having a bad pain day, I can still join a conversation on Quilt and not feel like I'm completely by myself. It doesn't matter if I look presentable or not, or what else I'm doing, because it's not like anyone can see me. One morning I had housework to do and someone had started an impromptu quilt for company while packing. It turned into this amazing discussion about clothing sizes and body positivity. I have a doctor's appointment to get up early for next Tuesday, so I'm gonna try to catch the Conscious Coffee series that's on weekday mornings. So. Maybe I'll see you there. And who knows? Maybe I'll try my hand at hosting a quilt myself. Quilt is currently available on iOS devices in the US. There's a link in the description to download the app. Thanks to Quilt for sponsoring this video. Looking at this robe francaise immediately reminds us of over-the-top 18th century French court fashions. However, these gowns with their flowing back pleats and open fronts worn over decorated stomachers are the stylistic grandchildren of the Mantua. This is a type of dress that became popular in the 1670s and 80s. In its earliest form, it was called the robe de chambre, which Google Translate tells me is French for dressing gown, and is a completely accurate description of its origins. Long, minimally shaped gowns had existed for hundreds of years in Western fashion among those who had the status to want clothes for lounging around in, 
or they could be worn over other dresses like the 15th century Italian Jonia to indicate status and show off expensive fabrics. Court fashions, especially at the French court of Louis XIV, were intensely formal with no regard for comfort. Formal court dresses had low-waisted bodices to reinforced from edge to edge with heavy stiffened linen and whalebone, sometimes in multiple layers. Usually, I have to point out that our modern standards of comfort are totally different and historic people wouldn't share them, but in this case, it seems that's not quite true. The formal French court dress codes remained in place throughout most of the 18th century, and in the 1769 book La Tutelle, the author François de Garçon says if the lady to be presented is not able to endure the heavily boned bodice, then she is allowed to wear a lighter one, covered with a mantilla, with the court train and petticoat. This refers only to the day of a lady's first appearance at court, and having an established dress code for these instances suggests that the usual heavily boned bodice was so uncomfortable by period standards that some people couldn't wear it even for a single event. So it's no wonder that whenever formal court dress wasn't required, people wanted something more comfortable to wear. Enter the mantua. Take your dressing gown, a full-length robe shaped only with pleating, draping, or a belt at the waist, and turn it into an actual dress. They were initially simple, with the sleeves cut in one piece with the body, which was fine when they were meant for throwing on over your nightgown or chemise. As they were adopted more and more for daily wear, the cut became more shaped, and there were worn over under bodices called stays that were more lightly stiffened and boned than full court bodices. The front could be either closed or open over a stomacher, and the long, unshaped skirts were draped over matching or contrasting petticoats. We have very few extant early mantuas because the simple construction made them easy to make over into other styles. The oldest is either the Valdemar Slot mantua, which I couldn't find good public domain photos of, but we do have great photos of this British mantua in wool with silver gilt embroidery, and this blue silk satin one from LACMA. The references we have show striped and patterned fabrics, a dramatic contrast from solid heavy satins popular in the 1660s. Mantuas and the accompanying stomachers and petticoats were covered with bows, ribbons, trim, and all sorts of light and fluffy decorating that made them even more of a change from the formal, stoic court dresses. They took off like wildfire, becoming the default style of informal dress throughout the European upper classes. It's important to note that this was very much a rich people thing. And even the simplest mantuas were still fancier than what working people were wearing when they were first invented. There was even a trend at the English court for having your portrait painted in loungewear. Many of Peter Lely's portraits of romantic negligence show upper-class women in elaborate mantuas, robes de chambre, or nightgowns, as they were called in English. And some were extremely risque, shall we say? How we got from the Mantua to this more recognizable robe francaise is an even more interesting story. The construction techniques used to make a Mantua were completely different from 17th century tailoring methods. Instead of drafting and cutting a fitted bodice to wear with a separate skirt, Mantuas were made by pleating and draping large pieces of fabric to fit the body. Robes de chambre, being untailored garments, weren't made by the professional male tailors who made formal court clothes. They were made by women, either at home as part of the housework, or by lower paid and lower status seamstresses. The popularity of the mantua created both more work and an increase in professional status for women who made clothes. Social attitudes shifted to expect nearly all women's clothes to be made by women, and the trade of mantua making developed. This was a huge deal because women were barred from becoming tailors for the same reasons they were barred from becoming lawyers or carpenters or any other trade or profession. Women simply weren't supposed to be independent tradespeople, no matter what the trade was. Instead of uncompensated domestic labor or low-status unskilled work, mantua making was one of the only professions in this severely sexist society where a woman could have a job with status and wages comparable to men. In France, where trade guilds continue to regulate clothing production, full dresses could only be made by master tailors until 1675. 
That year, women seamstresses or couturiers successfully petitioned the French crown to have their profession recognized and to establish their own trade guild. Male tailors reserved the right to make stays and formal court dresses, but nearly all other women's clothes and children's clothes could be made by the new guild of maîtresse couturière. All over Europe, the Mantua-making trade created employment opportunities for women that simply hadn't existed before. You could become an apprentice, work your way up in skill, and eventually own your own business and employ others. In 1747, the English book A General Description of All Trades says the following of Mantua makers. This trade belongs entirely to the women, both as to the work and the wear, and a very extensive one it is as well in the country as to the city. It is reckoned a genteel as well as profitable employ, many of them living well and saving money. They take girls and young women apprentices. To make a mistress, there is little else wanting than a clever knack of cutting and fitting, handsome carriage, and a good set of equipment. Acquaintance. All of those ribbons and laces and fluffy trims were also provided by women artisans, called marchands de mode, or milliners. It's the Mantua maker's professional status and this technique of fitting garments by draping that formed the foundation of the dressmaker's job, even through the 19th century. When fashions changed, as fashions exist to do, it was also these methods of pleating and draping that governed the new styles. After 40 or 50 years, the Mantua had become formalized and newer descendant styles of dress developed. The hoop skirt, introduced around 1711 in England, changed the construction of English Mantuas to accommodate the wide skirts. In France, the court environment relaxed dramatically when the Sun King died and his five-year-old great-grandson inherited the throne. With the Mantua having become so formalized and heavily decorated, an even less fitted style of dress was developed using the same pleating and draping techniques. Robes battantes and robes volantes, called sacs by the English, had wide pleats that hung all the way to the floor in the front and the back. Yes, people literally describe this as wearing a sack, and it was the height of fashion. It is with this informal loungewear dress that the iconic double box pleat we recognize in the robe francaise developed, and when these front pleats were stitched down to fit more closely, its evolution was complete. Until the 1780s, the old style heavy boned bodices were still required for all formal occasions. So what we recognize as the iconic, opulent Rococo Versailles court fashion is a fancy bathrobe. Literally the entire Western fashion industry was changed and women's economic status hugely advanced because rich people wanted to wear their dressing gowns all day. And because even French noble women had reached their breaking point for performing to uncomfortable beauty standards. It wouldn't be the last time this happened at the French court either. Please see Marie Antoinette and her popularization of the Chinese dress. But that's a whole other conversation that would require a deep dive into historical cottage core and all the racism and colonialism it involved. So I'm gonna give that its own video. Subscribe to catch that when it comes out. Let's scroll forward a couple hundred years to the Victorian era. Fashions have completely changed and then completely changed a few more times. Rich people were still doing rich people things, but now working class women got in on the idea of going out in loungewear for decidedly different reasons. Here is the 19th century prairie dress we recognize as the uniform of working class women from the colonization of the Western US to laundresses and cooks and charwomen all over Europe. The increasingly elaborate silhouettes of the 1870s were completely unsuitable for doing actual housework, so many working class women women stuck to simpler dresses in washable fabrics like cotton, and busy prints that wouldn't show stains as much. They might own more fashionable dresses for their Sunday best or other special occasions, but that's a topic for a future video. The general shape of a work dress might take cues from high fashion clothes, as working women certainly did enjoy looking nice day to day, but the blueprint of a semi-fitted bodice and a gathered or pleated skirt remained. However, these work dresses are literally one strip of fabric away from a dress that women were threatened with arrest for wearing. The Mother Hopper Wrapper. Wrappers and dressing gowns continued to exist in various forms through all those changes in fashion, ranging from opulent silk robes to simple wool or cotton ones. In the late 1870s and early 1880s, the fashionable princess line or natural form silhouette with its narrow fitted skirt was too narrow for serious housework. So work dresses had to diverge further from the fashionable shape. 
This combined with the rise of various dress reform movements, which idealized and romanticized earlier simpler styles of dress, created a greater demand for informal, loose-fitting, casual dresses for working class women. Some of these designs even feature Watteau pleats, an updated interpretation of the distinctive back pleats on the robe francaise. And I have to applaud them for this little nod to earlier styles of daytime loungewear. What made the Mother Hubbard wrapper distinct was that it was completely unshaped through the front bodice and fell straight from the shoulder to the hem. It was comfortable, it was easy to move in, usually made in washable fabrics, it was well suited to the hot weather common in the US, and in terms of showing or not showing the body, it was extremely modest. You could wear a looser corset, or a less boned one, or no corset at all, and no one would know. Think about staying home and deep cleaning your bathroom in a loose sweatshirt and no bra, or a plain sports bra, and tell me you do not understand the appeal. I do want to take a second to talk about a super similar style of dress called the holoku, which developed in the early 19th century as part of Western missionaries' racist, sexist, and otherwise horrible colonization of Hawaii and other Pacific Island nations. This style drew from the same material as Kate Greenaway did, the high-waisted and less fitted Western fashions of the early 19th century, and the yoked or pin-tucked nightgowns of the 1820s and 30s. Accounts of how it came into being vary. Some describe Hawaiian nobility being super excited about sewing machines and commissioning dresses made with Western methods. Others describe white missionaries forcing more modest, fashions on indigenous women because of their white supremacist views about indigenous dress. This happened both in Hawaii and various other Pacific Islands to indigenous North Americans too. The Western Mother Hubbard wrapper appears to have become popular independently, but once it did, the same term was used by Westerners and indigenous people both. I'm not qualified to say much more on this other than the usual, we don't like colonialism here. And that just like with any other historical outfit, <coughs> dressing like enslavers at plantations, <coughs> it's very important to understand the context and setting that a garment is in, because that can change its meaning. Since we're talking about working class women, I want to establish just how much work a 19th century working class housewife had to do. She was responsible for the labor of keeping an entire household and the people in it, cleaned, fed, clothed, educated, and socially accepted. She did not have a dishwasher or a fridge. She might not even have running water. Everything had to be done by hand by her or any children who were working in the home instead of outside it. So many women very sensibly said to themselves, why should I bother with all the fuss of changing clothes to walk to the market and then change right back again when I get home and need to scrub the floors? Or alternately, why should I bother changing into something less comfortable and less suitable for the weather? They felt it was a waste of time, and quite honestly, I agree with them. Most 19th century clothes did not take hours to change into. This is a myth we have to make ourselves feel superior, but it was still slower than changing clothes today. If you had the to-do list of a 19th century working class woman, every minute counted. Of course, in doing so, these women ran afoul of one of the most persistent, frustrating problems in existence. Men who can't keep their opinions to themselves. I've already made an entire video about the history of clothing as a defense from street harassment, so feel free to go check that out for an idea of just how much historical men could not handle women wearing interesting clothing. And apparently, they also couldn't handle women wearing boring clothes. It's almost like it's a rigged system where nothing you do is right. These men clearly had absolutely nothing more useful to do with themselves than write outraged letters to their local newspapers about what women were wearing. I'm leaning heavily on the work of dress historian Marta Davis here, who wrote the literal book on 19th century rappers, including several patterns from extant ones in her collection. Last year, I went through a similar set of newspaper complaints from men who didn't like women wearing 18th century hoop skirts for the video about street harassment, and I'm having a lot of deja vu. According to these men, who didn't realize no one ever asked what they thought, the Mother Hubbard wrapper looked like a nightgown, a sack, mosquito net, and a circus tent. It both did not look feminine enough, and it suggested the wearer was a sex worker soliciting clients by wearing her nightgown in public. 
Someone at the Ottawa Free Trader in 1883 saw the irony here and called it out, saying, The Bachelor editor of the Mendota Reporter was shocked the other day by meeting a lady on the street draped in one of those newfangled Mother Hubbard costumes. He thought the lady was in her nightgown. Nowhere had the editor ever seen a lady in her nightgown. Or what right has he to know anything about that garment anyhow? On the side of pure absurdity, the Mother Hubbard supposedly frightened horses and at least one carriage accident was blamed on the sight of a woman wearing one. Although a paper from Michigan gave the game away by simply stating, they frighten men too, and then followed it up with a goofy poem for good measure. To add to the Mother Hubbard's many other wrongdoings, it supposedly made the wearer look pregnant and was therefore liable to give the wrong impression about unmarried women. I find it really amusing that the complaint about looking pregnant was almost identically applied to 18th century hoop skirts, and even more amusing considering an earlier primary source account of an 18th century French court lady using one of our previously discussed pieces of fancy loungewear, the robe battante, to conceal but inadvertently announce her pregnancies. What matters is that, just like the complaints about hoop skirts, there is no coherent pattern here other than men didn't like it and were looking for reasons to object. The Mother Hubbard dress, both in style and in use, did not spare so much as a thought for the male gaze. It wasn't fashionable or ornamental or attractive, and it wasn't meant to be. To these men who were taught their whole lives that they were entitled to have all women perform prettiness to create a more pleasant backdrop for men's lives, a style of dress created with no regard for them or their enjoyment felt like an attack. The newspaper fuss seems to have died down after a few years as the Mother Hubbard became more commonplace and popular. As the Helena Weekly Herald said in August of 1884, the authorities, however, have undertaken a pretty big task if they expect to dictate what the women folks shall wear. The ladies of Illinois have as good a right to wear a Mother Hubbard or any other style of dress that suits them as the men have to wear fashionable pantaloons. Stand by your rights, ladies and we'll hold your hats. It would be remiss of me not to mention that because many of these working class women were people of color, the intersections of racism and sexism and classism add even more layers to how their choices were viewed. We already talked about how the holoku was used as a tool of racism and colonization towards indigenous people. In the US, although Europe absolutely does not get a pass on this, black people having the freedom to do literally anything but be treated as chattel was revolutionary. Like wearing whatever clothes they chose, including comfy ones, just like white women did. However, because racism is like this, women of color were judged by a completely different set of standards and judged harshly. If a white woman running errands in a wrapper was a bit dressed down, a black woman doing the same thing would be treated as proof of, insert any racist stereotype here, pretty much. At the same time, upper class white women were developing a different kind of high fashion loungewear dress called tea gowns. And oh my goodness, I actually cannot think of a better illustration of how gender and race and class intersect to form these ridiculous double standards than upper class white ladies and their tea gowns. The desire to wear comfy clothes transcends race, gender, class, and just about every other characteristic and high society had been into it for centuries. Here's a rapper from the 1850s, a little before the tea gown specifically became a thing. This looks almost exactly like the Mother Hubbard dresses, only made in expensive fabric with a fancy silk rope belt tied around the waist. The tea gowns that developed in this context were loungewear, yes, but very much of the sumptuous high fashion variety that the original French court mantuas were in the 1670s. They were strictly for at home wear and informal entertaining. So while the hostess could wear a tea gown, her guests would not unless only family and extremely close friends were present. Tea gowns were also strongly influenced by Orientalism and its prejudices, from the use of varied Asian fabrics and decorations in Western style cuts, to hapless and uninformed appropriations of traditional dress with no understanding of the cultural sources. The designs that focused on Western style elements were often inspired by the arts and crafts movement and its offshoots of artistic and aesthetic dress. 
basically a sort of 19th century cottagecore that like some elements of the modern cottagecore movement included racism, cultural appropriation, and romanticizing the working class while completely ignoring their reality. Once again, that's such a whole mess, it's gotta get its own video later. The gist of it is, if a white, upper-class woman wore a high-fashion tea gown in her own home, she was still upholding the social structures of the time and performing her assigned role of being an ornament to society. If a working class, perhaps non-white woman, wore a wrapper or Mother Hubbard dress out of her house, she was rejecting the demands of that role and those social structures. She was refusing to sacrifice her time, her comfort, and her labor to make herself presentable and ornamental for the gratification of random male passersby. The first is a woman doing what she was supposed to. The latter is a threat to the patriarchal social order. And of course, we couldn't have those. It is these same social structures that still have us feeling awkward about going to the grocery store in sweats, or needing those same sweats to be disguised as slacks for the office. Over a hundred years later, we are still being held to these same standards and for these same reasons, just with different material details. Instead of changing out of a wrapper, it's changing out of yoga pants, putting on makeup, doing your hair. But of course, if you do put on makeup and do your hair to run errands, then it's who are you trying to impress? Or you must be asking to be hit on by any random man. Late last year, I came across a few articles about Korean women going out with their curlers still in their hair, and it appears to be these same concepts playing out in our modern world. The women interviewed for these articles said it was a practical choice to leave their curlers in, rather than a political or fashion statement, that they didn't see a point in being perfectly presentable except for people they cared about. There may be a lot of cultural context I'm missing here, so if you are Korean and want to fill us in, please leave a comment. Both I and my viewers absolutely love hearing about fashion from around the world. If I am interpreting this correctly, it goes to show that this concept between performance and practicality and this double standard imposed on women are neither recent problems, nor have they faded away into history. For centuries before us, women have been looking for respite from the idea that if we are out in public, we owe the world a certain level of prettiness as if that's the rent we should pay for existing while female. We've been looking for a break from the implications that get pushed onto us when we do go along and pay that rent. The idea that if we look nice, we must want attention, no matter who it comes from or how disrespectful that attention is or what we're doing. I can shop for groceries just as well in sweatpants as I could in a dress. And since I have left my house to do nothing but get groceries, there's no point in dressing for anything other than my own comfort. So if you are someone who goes out in your cozy clothes, please know that you are part of a time-honored tradition of people who have quite rightly prioritized their own comfort and need to get things done over looking pretty for the benefit of random male-gazing passerby whose opinions they will never care about. And everybody else, when you see a woman with messy hair, no makeup, wearing loungewear, out in the world just trying to do her errands, leave her alone. Just leave her alone. Thank you for joining me on this adventure through the history of loungewear. Pop down in the comments and tell me about your favorite daytime pajamas, historical or otherwise. Leave a like while you're there and subscribe for more feminism flavored fashion history. And now I'm getting back under several blankets and I won't even have to change because I filmed this whole video in pajama pants. They have cats on them.